Uh, the first question we got is uh, from Rob Waters. Why are stocks delisted? Um, and originally that was why are stocks delisted from the Dow, but we decided to do why are stocks de delisted from the S and P, just because it's a better like broad index than the Dow. Um, so in the last few years, I don't think that many stocks have been delisted, but ones that you may have heard of that you, that you probably know of would be like a J.C. Penney or I think Avon was delisted in 2015. Um, there are five basic qualifications that the S&P has for stocks that need to that they need to fulfill generally we'll get to some of the exceptions in a bit um, in order to stay within uh, the index the first is that the S&P is a large cap index and they generally want companies to be above 5.3 billion in order to stay on there and that's 5.3 billion in market cap and, and just to just to reiterate Gabby's point it's like you know that that saying in in the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. I can't remember which pirate it was. He was like, "Oh, this is it's this is more guidelines as opposed to hard hard and fast rules." And so each of these things that we'll go through, each of these five components that Gabby talked about, or that that we're going to talk about, and he, she noted, um, all of these are just guidelines as opposed to hard and fast rules. Yeah, absolutely. Um, generally, the exceptions come when the market is not doing great, and if they were to strictly adhere to all of the guidelines, then there wouldn't be anyone in the S&P, and that would not be great for the S&P, right? So, you know, there's a little bit of flexibility here. Um, the second guideline, the first, like I'd like to remind you, is that it needs to have a market cap um, $5.3 billion or above. Uh, the second is liquidity. So, the stocks need to have traded a minimum of 250,000 shares over a six-month period leading up to the evaluation. Um, I think that the the example that we were talking about earlier, John, was uh, Berkshire Hathaway, which is a great company, right? People know about it; it's really stable. But for the longest time, it was not in the S and P 500 because shares were so expensive that people couldn't afford to trade them easily. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those really ironic things, right? I mean, when you think of our biggest and best large cap companies in the world, or in the United States at least, certainly Berkshire Hathaway is at the top of that, right? But the problem is that its shares for all of these years, or not all of these years, but for multiple years, traded above $100,000 per share. And it wasn't until 2010 when Berkshire purchased Burlington Northern um, Santa Fe, the, the railroad, that they did a stock split that then created a second uh, category of shares that then trade for much, much less. And then that is what has made it possible for your, kind of your individual investors to buy and sell it, which boosted its volume, which then made it, uh, which qualified in the, uh, for inclusion on the S&P 500. And um, one thing that another thing that all the companies on the S and P have in common is that they must be domiciled in the U S. and they define this in various ways, right? So they have to file a 10K, um, and then they say that you have to have a plurality of revenue and assets that are based in the U S. or your headquarters must be in the U S. Um, do you want to expand a little bit on why why they have it that way? Well, I mean, this is a—it's a large cap American index, and so what they mean, you know, plurality is I'm, as a lawyer, it's something that I'm, I'm relatively familiar with because it comes into play in Supreme Court decisions. But what a plurality means is that you don't have to have a majority, which would be at least fifty-one percent, but if you have, say, assets in five different com countries, and say thirty per, or forty percent of your assets are in the United States, and then whatever that would be—I don't know—fifteen percent in each of the other ones. A plurality means the largest of the group. So because it's a large cap index that's based in the United States, they want at least of all the company or all the countries that you're exposed to, they want the the largest share to be uh, in the United States. Right. And this has something to do with like avoiding tax laws and stuff like that too. So like some people will will register their companies in say like Hong Kong or Ireland because taxes are less and it just it gets complicated, but in general that's what they want. They want the companies to basically be based in the United States. Um, the stocks to stay in the S&P, they have to be listed on uh, the NASDAQ or the Dow. And they must also have a corporate governance structure consistent with U.S. companies. So You fill in the blanks there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have no idea what that means. What does that mean? Like, like, like Enron? <laughs> or does oh that mean God. like Berkshire Hathaway? <laughs> you know what I mean? It seems like the, the continuum there is probably pretty broad. I but only... I, I think the point they're trying to make is that they want you to follow the same accounting guidelines, and they want you to abide by at least the same the same content or the co concept of how you should be operating ethically. 
Right. Just like a general and something that's like written down so that people can look at it um, as opposed to like shadowy backdoor dealings. I think that's what they're trying to get out with that last one. Um, okay. So, so far we've covered large cap index, um, liquidity, domicile. Uh, the company must have a public float of at least 50% of their stock. Do you want to expound on that? Yeah, so you know when a company goes public, let's say Goldman Sachs is an example. When it went public in, I think it was 1999, they don't list 100% of the company, right? They'll list like I, I can't remember what it was with the Goldman Sachs, but it was a very, it was a pretty small percentage, maybe five percent, ten percent, something like that. The rest of that, that 90%, whatever that remainder is, is non-floated stock, right? So it's not traded on the active exchange. Well, the S and P 500 wants companies that have at least 50% of that. That's floated now, like Goldman Sachs in their situation. That float has increased over time as their over as their partners that were you know partners at the time of the IPO have sold out their positions and retired and diversified their assets and stuff like that. But you know, just the idea is that look, you want these to be you know public companies uh, that are highly liquid, and in order for those things to to kind of to kind of come into play, you need a large float. Right, um, and that kind of ties into. A little bit into the last one, which is financial viability. So this is probably the most common reason for stocks to get delisted is that there's something fundamentally wrong with them. Um, I think one of the latest stocks to be delisted was Peabody Energy, um, and you saw that their credit rating just got bumped and bumped and bumped again, all downward. Um, so it's just they have to have positive earnings over the last four quarters, and they have to have good credit ratings. They just have to seem like a fundamentally sound business. In general, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, this is a again, this is a general rule, right? I mean, like you want like viable. You don't want the S and P five hundred full of these companies that don't make any money, right? I mean, like what would that say about an index that's supposed to, that's supposed to track you know the you know the large cap sector of the United States, our biggest and best companies, right? But again, you know the the way the S and P you know the methodology you know lays it out says you got to have positive earnings over the past four quarters. Well, if you were back to the financial crisis, right, and you were a stickler on that, well, the S and P five hundred would be like the S and P five. You know, <laughs> it's just like you know you, you don't want to be like you don't want to push it so far that it would defeat the whole purpose of the thing. But as a general rule, they're just what they're just getting at here is that they want good companies that adequately represent what America's biggest and best companies, you know for lack of a better term, represent. Right. And I'm going to say that in general, I don't, I don't, ha- I haven't ever seen the S&P delist a company and someone say, oh, that was vindictive. It always is kind of like, yeah, they kind of saw that coming. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's exactly right. It's like JC Penney's, right? A, co- a few years ago. I mean, it's like going down, going down, going down, going down. And the S&P 500 like finally released like, okay, fine. You know what I mean? Like we got to get rid of these guys. I mean, it's getting, it's getting pretty ugly here. Oh, and fun fact, when someone gets delisted, someone else can come on. That's exactly right, because it's got to stay at 500. Exactly. You can't have 501. That would be absurd. (laughs) I mean, you could, but you kind of have to change the name, you know? (laughs) Yeah.